When you first open vCarve, you'll need to create a new file up here. Here we'll set our width to typically 48 inches and our height to 96 inches in the X and the Y because that's a 4x8 sheet of plywood. And we'll usually set our zero to be at the top of the sheet. Our thickness of this piece that we're going to be using is 3 quarters of an inch because it's 3 quarter nominal. However, it's not actually 0.75 inches. 3 quarter nominal plywood is actually only 23 30 seconds, which ends up to be about 0.72 inches thick. We're not normally going to use an offset. We're going to put our 0, 0 down here in the lower left corner, as you can see there. However, if we do want to use an offset, we could type in something like 6, 6, and you can see now that our 0, 0 is here, and our piece is actually here. Now, of course, we can't put a 4x8 sheet of plywood on the machine at this point with a 6, 6 offset, so we'd have to change our dimensions, but we're not going to do any of that. So we're going to get rid of offset, make sure that's in the lower left, if you want to do circles and things, sometimes it's useful to put your datum position in the center, but usually we're going to use lower left. And all this here, standard walnut, yeah, fine. Doesn't really matter there. So once we click OK, we can see this main interface here where we'll do our design. All this up here should look fairly familiar. You can do cuts. You can set your job dimensions in origin again if you need to go back. Here's where we would change that. We're going to cancel out for now. We've got some view controls, zooms, zoom to fits, make circles, we can make boxes, polygons, stars. All this stuff here is where we'll do our drawing. And this should be fairly familiar to you for, you know, other, if you've used Paint or Illustrator before. All these different text and text effects. For our example here, we're going to try to route out some text. I'm going to type my name. I've got fonts here, text height. For the example, we need it to be 12 inches tall. So I'll type that in here. The anchor point, I want my text to be at, let's say, 1-1, one, one, because we usually you're going to have a screw near 0-0. Zero, zero. So we don't ever put something directly at 0-0. Zero, zero. I'm also going to change this font here. Let's maybe find something else. We've got quite a few choices here. These are good for engraving. That's why these fonts are preloaded. We could, of course, use true type fonts, but these single line fonts here we know work really well. If I were to pick a true type font, we can pick something, oh, I don't know, nah. Well, let's see here. What about that one? Apply. Okay. That's good enough. That'll route quite well. And of course, I can move it around here by changing my anchor point. Anytime I make a change, I need to hit the apply for it to show up. So I can move it to 6.3 like so. I want this to be centered on my wood, ultimately, uh, but not right now. So let's say, let's put it at 2.2. Two. That'll give us plenty of clearance for our screw to go down in the lower left corner. Okay. Now, we've got all these different editing things and transforms. We can move them. We can set their size. Here, this anchor point, as you can see, is chosen to be in the center. This should be familiar to you that use Illustrator. Right there, we can see our X is at 19.35. Well, that's not necessarily where I want it. I've got a four-foot sheet of plywood. So let's move this to the center, maybe. So let's type in 24 and apply, and you can see now it's dead centered on my sheet of wood there, which for this example is what I want. But you can easily move stuff around like this. Just choose your anchor point and then type in its position where you want it, and we can move it back to 2-2 if we need to. Offsetting vectors, you guys have probably done this before. You can go out to the right or in left, depending on whether it's a closed or open curve. That determines whether it's right, left, or open, or in, out. If I do a quarter inch like this, you can see it just barely offset my name. You can see that there is now a second line a quarter inch away, but I don't need it, so I delete it. Node editing, don't need that, but that's a lot like the white arrow tool in Illustrator. I can group all these, I can ungroup them, measure them, cut them, trim them, all these different things. Now, what I recommend is you use these layers if you're going to have multiple design elements. I'm going to put each letter on a separate layer. So I'm going to click new layer and keep adding new layers. When you do layers, it's really handy because then you can go back and redo only one design element if you want to. So I'm going to click this here and I'm going to convert it to curves. This is like convert to outlines in Illustrator. These are no longer letters. Now these are individual vectors. And I recommend you do this for the same reason we do it in Illustrator it's easier to make changes later, as long as you don't want to change the text. So I'm going to go individually and click on each of these and move them to their own layers that I've just set up a second ago. 
and you can go up here and turn them off if you don't want to see them. This is handy if you only want to route part of your design or if you need to redo only a part of your design. This is why layers are really handy and I encourage you to put individual design elements on their layers. I'll select them all here and I can make an array if I need to. Sometimes you're going to want to do this. It's just like copy paste over and over. You set the parameters of what you want to do. You can see currently my design is 34 by 12. Let's say I want three rows, one column, and here I can change gap or offset. I'm going to use gap because I need to specify the spacing between them. I want it to be sufficient enough, and usually three quarters is sufficient. Our bit is usually a quarter inch wide, and so I can't go less than a quarter, and I can't go less than two multiples of quarter because then there'll be nothing in between. I've got to leave a little bit of wood in between each uh, pattern, so that's why I set 0.75. But I don't want to do that right now. So let's go over here to tool paths. It's time to cut some stuff. I'm going to pin that so it doesn't move. And what we're going to want to do for this example is route this out so that we can hang these letters on a wall or something or place them on another backer board. This profile tool path is the one we're going to use most often. There's others, drillings, pockets, and stuff like that, all these other fancy engraving tool paths that we don't use a whole lot, but there they are. All these different functions, finishing, whatnot. We're going to use the profile tool path. I'm going to select all my vectors and do them in one operation because it's all just a profile tool path. So I don't need four separate tool paths for this. I'll do it as one. So here I'm going to check profile tool path. My cut depth is 0.76. I need to cut a little... Oh. Our wood, remember, is 0.72. But I want to add 0.03 to that to make sure that it goes all the way through and doesn't leave anything hanging. So you can do math here in this little tab if you want or you can just type something in, which is, say, 0.75. Our end mill is usually the quarter inch, but here's where we go to select all our different tools. I'll click on the quarter inch end mill here. You can see all of its different parameters. It's going to take a default pass depth of an eighth of an inch, which is half its diameter. We never want to go deeper on a pass than the diameter of our tool. Half the diameter of the tool is great. It's very low stress on the tool. 12,000 RPMs. We don't have any uh, control over our speed with this setup, and we use 100 inches a minute feed rate and 30 inches a minute feed rate in the vertical by default. Here's where we can choose. Do we want it to go inside or outside? Well, we want our letters to be 12 inches tall, and if we go inside, it'll be too small. So we've got to go outside. We usually use climb cutting. I'm not going to choose an allowance, but if I wanted to, this is how I would do it. This would offset the tool another eighth of an inch. We're going to pick zero. I don't need to do a separate finishing pass, but I do need to add tabs. Tabs are the little things that we're going to chisel out at the end. These are going to hold the letters into our workpiece so that they don't fly out the second that the bit makes that final cut. Here we can add them manually or just pick constant number and add tabs like so. And there you can see where all of our tabs are going to be. Problem is with these, interior corners like this are kind of hard to chisel out later. So I'm going to go and delete all these just by clicking on them. That little X will appear, and then you can click on them and delete them. And you can, of course, click anywhere on these purple lines to add new tabs. So I'm going to go get all the corner tabs that are interior and exterior corners, delete them, and just move the tabs slightly off the corners. It puts them in the upper left corner by default as tab 1, as you can see, and I, it's hard to chisel those out. So I'm going to go and move all these away from the corners. But it does a pretty good job, generally, of adding tabs. And then, so these are little tabs of wood they are going to get left by the machine. And then we'll go back with a chisel afterwards and knock these out to actually punch out the letters. There we go. You can see they're a half inch long and an eighth inch tall. Let's give this toolpath a descriptive name. Because when we have a lot of toolpaths on a job, you're going to want to know what's what. So I'll hit Calculate. Warning again, yes, it's going to cut through by 30 thousandths. That is what we want, so we'll click OK. Now here we can see a simulation. Oop, let me zoom in and drag this back up. Shift, control, drag, click, all that stuff. You'll get used to it. It's kind of not the same as some of the other programs we use, but you can see the little tool pads it's going to do. It's going to do six passes, it said. And now we can preview these over here. I'm going to dial the speed back quite a ways. Oak, we're going to usually do it in pine or something like that. So let's pick pine. It doesn't really matter, but that's you can, you can do it. Preview all toolpaths. Preview visible toolpaths. There are no visible toolpaths. 
That's because this isn't checked. Check the toolpaths, preview the visible ones, or you can preview all, and there you can see the toolpath, that, that it's, that's what it's gonna do. What you see here is what you get. You need to always preview your toolpaths because if this doesn't look right, the final thing won't look right. And you can see all the little tabs in there that we'll chisel out later. And none of them are in the corners, so they'll be easy to remove. And it's going to look just like that. Pretty nice. And they'll be exactly 12 inches tall. So I'll close this over here. And now I need to save this file. If I need to get back to preview, I click here on this little thing, and I'd bring that menu back up. Here's all the different things, but here's the Save Toolpath button, the little disk. You guys have probably never seen a floppy disk, but here it is. There are no visible toolpaths. There we go. Check it. One, it's an end mill, quarter inch. We need this Easy Router Mach3-tap file, but here's all these others for other machines that we don't have. Then we save our toolpath to file with a descriptive name and click Save. Okay. And then that's all there is to that. And now we'll go run our job.